Today we have asked uh, Secretary French, uh, Secretary of Education, and our Ledge Council, Jim Demaray, to come in and walk us through the proposals that the governor put forward, uh, as well as have uh, committee questions and discussion. Very happy uh, to have our House counterparts with us, and uh, without a doubt, that will lead to a, a richer, um, better discussion. So, so thank you all. Thank you, Representative Webb, um, for taking the time to join us. So with that, I thought I would uh, turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, Secretary French, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, I suspect you had a bit of an inside scoop on what was going to be proposed uh, and what would be helpful to us, and Representative Webb, please feel free to add or edit this accordingly, is just to take us through the governor's proposals, uh, give us some, uh, the genesis for them, uh, you know, what everyone is thinking, why they were uh, put forward, any other relevant information that you think we should know before we start digging into them um, in our uh, separate committee, during our separate committee times. And then afterward, we'll hear a little bit uh, additional detail from Ledge Council. Committee members, uh, if you have a question, I think perhaps the best thing to do is I will certainly keep an eye open regularly for uh, people raising their hands. If possible, uh, you could do uh, both a combination if you see that we're not calling on you, a combination of the virtual hand as well as your actual physical hand. And, and I will take a look and survey the screen so as to make certain that nobody is left out. So with that, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the committee. I uh, hope you're all doing well, um, both committees. Um, and I think we have an hour allotted, or on my calendar, I have an hour. So uh, I think we have a lot of time for discussion. Um, I did put together uh, sort of an outline that summarizes some of the major ideas. I don't know, uh, Jeannie, um, I do have the ability to share my screen. so. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put that on the screen. I think you all might have received a copy of this in advance. Um, but I think the, probably the easiest thing to do is for me to go through the whole thing um, and then um, open it up to questions um, at the end, if that's okay. Great. Thank you. So um, this starting and sort of to back up a little bit, because um, I think the budget addresses, you know, as you know, an important milestone um, and sharing sort of the administration's perspective on policy concepts. But uh, we were, as you know, very, uh, very actively involved in uh, our pandemic response and particularly in education. I think there's been a, um, an acknowledgement from the very beginning of the response that as, as much as uh, we were act, you know, actively responding to an unprecedented emergency, that people started to notice uh, fairly early on that perhaps there was opportunity here as well. Um, I think, you know, particularly the use of technology, which is something uh, many have observed um, had, had transformed other aspects of our society more rapidly, but an education was on a slower trajectory. And I think we can all say as, in, as imperfect as remote learning has been, it has certainly accelerated our use of technology and exposed many deficiencies in that, but there's not all bad news there as well. So. At any rate, sort of striking this balance between, um, you know, making some observations about the response, but also the opportunities. I think to that end, uh, it's hard for me not to put some emphasis on the COVID-19 response as I talk about this sort of policy um, vision, if you will. Um, but certainly starting with this idea and our commitment to all students, um, and that we have arguably one of the best education systems in the country, but it's, it's working better for some students uh, as compared to others. And um, in particular, it's sort of the second bullet, acknowledging that um, this moment in history that we're in is really about uh, the personal learning needs of students and the ability to perhaps deliver for the first time in our history on uh, focusing the system around their aspirations. But importantly, as we've uh, you know, we travel around the state, I've worked statewide, but particularly as we've done uh, sort of our capital for a day excursions out to each part of Vermont, um, we also know that we have some work to do to ensure that students in all parts of the state have access to a high quality education system. Um, there is a certain amount of unevenness from region to region of the state. 
And I think I think that's going to be a, um, a challenge for all rural states going forward is how do we uh, not only ensure uh, equity, but also that quality of a 21st century learning environment for, for all students, regardless of where they live, uh, and particularly for students in our more uh, rural areas. Uh, but then lastly, just sort of this disposition, I think we've ingrained uh, in our response from the COVID-19, this idea of being nimble, being alert. Um, there's opportunities here, perhaps. And um, we, we sometimes think about uh, a risk of the system, I think, naturally wanting to spring back to where it was prior to COVID, and that there might be some lessons learned that we, we don't want to lose. So uh, that's sort of a general introduction to sort of the policy context. Um, as we were working in the middle of the response and through the summer heading into the uh, budget proposal, if you will, um, we started with a lot of different policy ideas. We work uh, on an interdisciplinary uh, basis among the different agencies, uh, particularly uh, the COVID response has required us to do that. I think that's been a key aspect of our success to a certain extent. Um, but we look at many of the ideas that emerge and it's, it shouldn't be surprising to anyone that education figures prominently, um, both from an economic standpoint and a social uh, standpoint, as a key strategy of policy um, today in the, in the world of a knowledge-based economy. So the policy ideas that we've generated uh, fall into uh, six buckets, if you will. So firstly, this idea of uh, giving every student off to a good start, um, ensuring equal opportunity for all students is something that certainly has always been um, it's part of our constitution. It's part of our ethos, I think, in Vermont. Uh, but certainly in the last year, um, some of the things we see nationally uh, in terms of uh, police brutality, <clears throat> uh, some of the hate uh, that's been emerging uh, more rampantly in our country has put new emphasis on this idea. And it's one I think we're, we're trying to shift more into taking action um, as opposed to um, sort of admiring the issues, if you will. There's more work we can do here and we want to move more aggressively into that domain. Um, expanding learning opportunities for students. <clears throat> As I mentioned, um, it's it's really, it's going to be one of the great challenges, I think, for all rural states uh, to ensure that all students have access to a, a true high quality 21st century learning environment. And um, we talk a lot about that in different ways, uh, but one in particular I, I can just share with you, um, one that's been weighing on my mind a lot in the last four weeks uh, is music and the arts. Um, we've struggled, I think, probably the, the area that's been most difficult for us to uh, develop a path forward in our COVID-19 guidance for schools has been the arts. Um, unfortunately, there was quite a bit of research done early on with some uh, chorus events, chorales uh, internationally, and uh, their link, the link between singing and the aspiration of the spread of the virus. <clears throat> so there's quite a bit of research about the dangers of music. And our infectious disease experts have been somewhat reluctant to uh, move forward in that area. It's something we're still hoping to do. But when I think about this in the context of learning opportunities, it's not just about technology or access to curriculum. It's even in, as we speak about the arts <clears throat> and what does it mean if you're a student in a rural community uh, that doesn't have an ensemble uh, to learn from, to play with, to interact with. Um, you know, we, we talk about this often from the perspective, perspective of AP courses and so forth, but it's, it's important to acknowledge that um, artistic talent and ability is, is probably fairly equally distributed, uh, but opportunity is not. And um, these, these are once again, some of the challenges I think for um, all rural states, but it's one we should endeavor to take a look at. <clears throat> uh, number four, this issue of I'll call pipeline issues. Um, is one I think we haven't spent enough detention on uh, to my satisfaction. I think as a rural state, uh, particularly with our demographic challenges, um, we're gonna have to um, spend more time on this topic. Uh, what's our pipeline development for teachers, particularly as we're contemplating uh, potential contraction of our state college infrastructure, which historically is one of our primary pipelines for developing new teachers. Um, do we do we have to address issues of reciprocity, which is an idea I'll put in, I'll mention here in a minute, meaning uh, how difficult it is it for teachers from other states to come to Vermont. So I think, you know, this is an area I don't think we spend enough time on, but one uh, we're very interested in uh, due to the demographic challenges that, that are uh, in front of us. <clears throat> um, improving pathways between high schools and CTE centers. 
uh, a perennial issue, um, and we have some ideas on that. Um, once again, you know, in some places of the state, this is less of a concern than others, but it's certainly not, um, it's not equal across the state. And in some places, the, the barriers uh, for students to move among those programs is, can be quite challenging. And lastly, um, opportunities to modernize the system. And um, this is an area I think it's, uh, as you heard in the governor's budget address, some interest in addressing infrastructure issues, technical debt, if you will, um, but also I know uh, both committees have expressed interest in uh, the agency's capacity. Um, and certainly, I mean, from my observation, uh, one of the places we can go in terms of increasing that capacity, it's not just the case of adding staff, but also looking at our processes, our regulations and so forth to see if they can be streamlined. Um, and there's a couple areas in here that I'll highlight that I think would uh, not only modernize our approach, but also add capacity to the agency's uh, ability to uh, support our school districts. So those are the major themes, um, and I'll sort of walk into a little more detail now under each of those. And once again, I'm happy to, we can have a general conversation or a specific conversation about any of these things towards the end. Um, uh, getting every child off to a good start. Um, a centerpiece of what we'll be wanting to discuss is literacy reform. Uh, this is a topic, you know, uh, nationally, there's a lot of interest in this. Our data uh, points to it should be a concern for us as a state and an area of targeted uh, intervention. Uh, we suspect as a result of COVID, this is an area that, that is a, a good area for us to uh, seek some improvement. Um, our excursion on this started with Act 173 and the research behind Act 173, which is arguably about special ed reform, uh, but also highlighted uh, the fact that um, particularly in grades pre-K through three or K through three, uh, that uh, by the end of grade three, our student outcomes aren't that great. Uh, basically, about half of our students are proficient uh, in, in ELL or language um, at the end of grade three. Uh, we're starting to see a disturbing trend in our NAEP data as well as the National Assessment of Education Progress um, that the average scale score in NAEP has been dropping fairly consistently over the last several years, but perhaps more disturb disturbingly when we disaggregate that data, it shows that many of our students are doing just fine, uh, but some of our more vulnerable populations, their achievement levels are declining. Uh, so we have some real equity issues. So I think, you know, um, also when we start thinking about early education, and how to um, improve outcomes there because we have a, quite a bit of research that shows that's probably one of our best investments to make uh, as an education system. How to, it's a very complex policy area, how to, um, how to get into from a data perspective, an outcome perspective. And I think here too, literacy uh, provides a very convenient way for us to think about all the effort and activity that goes into uh, through birth through three and then three through five. Um, we can use literacy perhaps as a proxy for healthy brain development, nutrition, social, emotional development, as well as academic success. It's something we can measure quite well. And uh, the measurements we do have right now indicate that uh, we have some room for improvement. And I think particularly when we start to see the equity issue show up in the data, uh, here too becomes a place where we can uh, focus our efforts. And the uh, initiative we'll be bringing forward in literacy for your consideration is comparable to one uh, we had became involved in last year. Uh, so in many cases, not, not new ideas, uh, more or less some of the same uh, thinking that we had brought forward previously. Uh, we have a, a structural uh, proposal uh, to bring over the um, child care functions of the CDD uh, to the Agency of Education. Uh, the governor mentioned this in the inaugural address. Uh, this is um, more complex, I think, from a structural standpoint. We're just, we think it's time to take this conversation on in spite of the complexity and uh, look forward to working uh, with the committees, legislative leaders, stakeholder groups to consider this. Uh, from my perspective, um, my thinking originally started thinking about Act 166 as possibly the place we should work first and then worry about the structure later on. Um, but after a couple of years of working in this uh, structural uh, piece, I think it's the, the getting coherence on a structural side would aid with the policy. Um, we've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time inside of state government just bringing uh, the two agencies together, 
Um, and um, we have issues uh, with federal funding that sort of fall across the, those boundaries and uh, data quality assurance that fall across the agency boundaries. So I think it would be very useful um, to bring, bring these together under, under one agency's supervision. Um, this is not about uh, having the public education system become early involved in learning care. This is just about bringing those teams together under one agency. Um, many other states do it this way. I would say more states do it the way we have it. So it's, it doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, a major transformation, but I think it sets the stage for that transformation, which is an integrated policy uh, zero, to, zero to five. Um, so that's that's a conversation uh, we look forward to having with you. We, we acknowledge that's a complex conversation, but one it's time to have. I think um, this last one, property tax exemption for pre-K centers, is fairly, I would say, simple from a uh, policy standpoint. It is it is exactly what it sounds like. It's it's fairly straightforward. Tax our tax department has done some analysis on this. This would be. Uh, private pre-K centers, uh, we promote uh, property tax exemption for them. So one, one tool we think we might have to um, offer them some uh, financial stability or to help help them uh, with their uh, business models. Um, the liability on that from a property tax perspective is somewhere around $500,000, I think, on the grand list. Um, but once again, we think it's uh, something we can try to do to, to help them in that regard. Um, all students being well supported. Um, this first item uh, is just to highlight that uh, the General Assembly uh, launched this initiative uh, last year, and uh, we think it's a really important one. This work is just getting started. Um, the After School Task Force, um, we think it's very important to think about full service schools, wraparound services for schools. And I think as a state, we were, as once again, as part of our rural sort of understanding, we were heading down this path anyway. Um, but I think particularly with COVID recovery work in front of us, and then um, also probably some interest on the part of the Biden administration to focus on this area, it would behoove us to really just acknowledge that this could be a potential uh, asset for us to understand as a state and to uh, leverage particularly as we uh, come out of the COVID emergency. So to think more broadly about the use of time, um, how after school programs um, can function uh, on multiple levels, not just for academic support, but also for recovery support, um, the, the engagement support that we think students will need as a result of COVID. So it's just, uh, just wanna sort of put a pin in it, if you will, um, but we think it's a major uh, strategy um, that uh, we've worked with the General Assembly to, to get moving. And I think it's one that's we just don't want to lose sight of. Uh, so nothing new to do there, just to, just put some emphasis on it that we think it's going to be useful to leverage us going forward. Um, <clears throat> a, key, a key one for us, I think, both in terms of agency capacity and just improving our ability to support all students is... Uh, and it almost falls in the modernization bucket, uh, but to look at the restructuring of responsibilities between the agency and the State Board of Education. Uh, this is a bit of a, I would call a legacy work to a certain extent that um, we have, uh, as you know, uh, elevated a commissioner to a secretary of education. Um, so the, the secretary reports directly to the governor, uh, the agency of education um, theoretically then has responsibility for regulation, but we've we've never finished sort of that next piece of the work, which is to look at regulation. And um, there's there's been some challenges in this area in terms of uh, our capacity. We spend quite a bit of amount of time at the agency supporting the state board um, appropriately, uh, but it it could be considered duplicative uh, in some cases. And arguably, um, in the last five years, we've been working on very complex policies. Uh, not to say. Uh, they haven't always been that complex, but honestly, special ed reform is probably one of the most complex areas, and we have a major special ed reform in front of us with Act 173. Um, General Assembly's given quite a bit of uh, authority to the state board in this area. The state board's been working really hard uh, to get up the speed on special education and so forth, but it's it's been a huge lift uh, for everyone involved. So. We'd like to uh, pick this conversation back up. Um, we kind of made some progress on it last year. Uh, but we think it's one that um, it needs to be addressed sooner and later. And I think there are issues here, particularly around education quality. Um, we haven't necessarily had the best uh, connection between statutory 
policy goals and regulation. Um, we've had a couple of areas, and, and the one I'd highlight right now is this idea of education quality, where um, most states right now are operating under federal uh, education policy. It's called the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. Uh, prior to that, it was the No Child Left Behind Act. Um, states are required to have a state accountability plan, essentially, under federal law, um, <clears throat> which is our major uh, oversight function in terms of ensuring the quality of our schools. Our, our state ESSA plan in Vermont was never uh, signed by the governor, was never approved by the State Board of Education, and never approved by the General Assembly. Um, many of the structural elements in that, such as integrated field reviews and so forth, uh, do not exist anywhere in regulation. Um, so we, we have a real disconnect from uh, what, what should be a statutory direction or responsibility or accountability and our regulation. Uh, so we we are sort of operating in almost a no man's land, so to speak, in terms of uh, an accountability system to improve our, our schools. Um, and that's unfortunately the major, one of the major tools in our toolbox right now. So those kinds of uh, issues, um, I think it's, I understand how they ended up the way they did, but um, I, I, I just have to point out the obvious that um, we, we need to leverage our regulation if we're gonna make progress on addressing both quality and equity for our students. Regulation's a major tool in the toolbox, and right now there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, so at any rate, we think that's a, a major area of um, emphasis and work. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time in state government, as I mentioned, uh, largely uh, well, sort of the national climate, but we knew as a state we, we have some work to do in this area, as all states do. Um, you know, we have our first ever uh, state equity coordinator, Susanna Davis. She's been doing a lot of work at the state level. We have a, uh, a larger state plan uh, to move, once again, a state more in an action disposition towards some of these issues. Um, we've sort of pivoted off that work a bit to offer some ideas in education, uh, which I think um, represent to a certain extent some of the work that's already going on in some places among our school districts. but. Uh, it's time, we think, to elevate that to uh, a policy emphasis that all districts are moving forward. So this first one, um, curriculum required uh, to address hate issues, we, we would do this through the promulgation of a model curriculum. So we've had a, um, a delicate balance in our state that the State Board of Education promulgates standards, but the locals have curriculum. We still are endeavoring to preserve that balance, but in this case, we would promulgate a model curriculum uh, for locals to consider. Um, and this this first bullet grew out of some uh, review of national work. It's sort of also related to the work of the Act One or Ethnic Studies group that's been meeting. Um, but we also noticed districts taking on issues of uh, mascots and so forth. And um, this is where we think there's, there should be a broader framework. It isn't, it isn't just subject to the lo sort of local political forces, but the state should have a, a little more uh, guidance for districts on how to engage on some of these activities and would help, I think, uh, communities uh, work through that more productively. Uh, similarly, uh, we think it's time for a mandatory policy on racial equity uh, for school boards. Um, this would elevate the issue of racial equity to the same level as uh, bullying and harassment, where there are mandatory policy requirements for school board. Uh, so we think uh, school boards, um, through a model policy that we would uh, create um, that would uh, require them to engage on this topic of racial equity, which is, you know, from our model policy that we would develop in our proposal would include hiring, um, you know, very broad, uh, would address curriculum instruction issues as well. Um, a task force on school disciplinary procedures. Um, I know there's a bill that's already been uh, induced on this in a parallel way. I think this is, uh, we acknowledge as well as one, uh, we'd like to see some work done on. Um, I think the difference between uh, what we're going to propose is the, uh, not so much emphasis on gathering the data. We think the data is certainly there and it could be improved. But we already know, we know enough about what our best practices in discipline, and we'd like to focus, um, not spend a lot, lot more time gathering the data, uh, but just to start with uh, what, are the, what are the best practices in discipline and um, non-exclusionary discipline practices in particular, uh, restorative justice and so forth, and identify those best practices and uh, just sort of skip the steps of gathering data 
um, and go right to uh, the best practice that's out there in research and so forth, and then uh, create a process by which those best practices can be broadly disseminated across the state. Uh, lastly, uh, an interest in um, school facilities, and uh, this was an issue we uh, were working on last year in the General Assembly in cooperation, particularly with the Superintendents Association. Um, this, I think, gets into two pieces. One is school construction, uh, which is to do an assessment of the um, potentially uh, of the facility so that that would inform um, some sort of modification of, or resurrection of a school construction program for which there's been a moratorium for a number of years. We understand that's that's a complex topic and it's one that probably needs uh, some new policy uh, thinking on. But then we also have the issue of deferred maintenance in schools, um, which is not necessarily construction. And uh, this is an area where um, we'd like to see what we could do and put some more effort on um, helping schools improve their basic safety and health and well-being and this is uh, i just sort of draw that distinction between maintenance and construction uh under the law you know school school boards are largely charged with maintaining their facilities but we have uh, as we've seen with lead and drinking water and pcbs most recently um we had some issues that sort of transcend school board uh, authority in that regard and one, ones the state would probably should come in on a more helpful basis that don't really rise to the level of construction per se um, so we'd like to work a little bit more on this issue of deferred maintenance and see what we can do to help help districts sort of tackle that as a starting point, while at the same time we're doing assessment of the construction facilities needs. I would I would just observe that um, all these fall into for us into this category of equal opportunity for students is there's a direct connection between quality facilities and opportunity. Um, as there are with these essential um, social conditions for students, all students to be successful. Um, and they do require, I think, uh, more state involvement in these areas to ensure that equal opportunity. So that's why we've sort of put them together into this, this one category. Expanding learning opportunities for students. Um, the first one, simplifying our home study regulations. Uh, we had a essentially a, over 100% increase in home study as a result of COVID-19, and uh, that exposed for us a couple of things. One is we had to uh, scramble to allocate more staff to this area from other aspects of our agency. Um, but it also exposed part of the reason we had to do that is because our regulations are very complex. Um, they're arguably some of the most complex home study regulations I've encountered. I've been pulling them down from different states particularly among New England states. So um, this is this is labeled as simplifying home study regulations. It's um, it'll provoke a conversation about, you know, what is the role of the state in home study versus what is the role of the parent, uh, but also just to look at, frankly, agency capacity in this area. Um, one of the reasons we struggle with capacity on this is that the regulations are exceedingly complex. Um, so we're happy to show some of that analysis that we've done compared looking at what other states have. Um, we think we have some room for improvement here, starting with the statutory framework for home study. And we think we'll, we'll have some broad support for this as well. Uh, VTVLC is the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative. Um, we, it's essentially our virtual school in Vermont. Uh, we've been building this platform out over the years. Uh, with COVID-19, um, we use some of our federal and our state dollars to expand their access in many uh, many of the remote uh, learning programs that schools have enacted are built on top of the VTLVC platform and expertise. Uh, so this, this program is housed in Springfield at the Spring, Springfield Technical Center. Um, they offer um, a lot of professional development for teachers to learn how to teach online and so forth and been very successful in offering courses and expanding uh, the curriculum that's available to all Vermont students. Uh, so we'd like to see that leverage. This is an example of something after COVID-19. We'd, we'd like to see um, more remote learning or used certainly better than um, what we experienced last spring, but we still think there's a major role uh, for remote learning in a rural state like Vermont, particularly as we contemplate expanding uh, curriculum and learning opportunities for students. Uh, for some students in the state, you know, remote learning is a really good option uh, for providing additional access to curriculum. 
um, we have a mechanism in the current law uh, about the ability of supervisory unions to contract with each other for services, and it just sort of ends at that. So we, you know, supervisory unions can contract with each other for different services, and we've seen that play out over the years. Sometimes supervisory unions will contract with each other uh, to share a teacher, um, to provide accounting services, you name it. Um, We'd like to see uh, sort of more of that conversation focused around uh, enrollment exchange of students. I don't say school choice per se, but we have a essentially a school choice law now in Vermont um, that works on a lottery basis. During COVID, um, it emerged there's a pattern. We had a couple districts that were struggling with, um, particularly teachers who lived in one district, but they're taught in another district and they wanted to be able to take their students with them to work in the other district. And um, we didn't really have good models of how to enable that from a contracting standpoint, basically how to do a cost neutral swap, if you will, of the money. And uh, we think we can probably add a little bit more incentive or clarity to this area of contracting without really talking about restructuring um, how we deal with money following students or not. Um, but we'd like to see um, districts, you know, not having barriers essentially to engage in these kinds of conversations. Similarly, we think there's some room, particularly with remote learning, to talk more about sort of a la carte um, course taking exchanges. You know, if I want to take a course in another district, um, how do I do that? And we saw quite a bit of that with, um, particularly with VTVLC, with districts standing up their own virtual academies. Um, we saw districts interested or students interested in taking courses in other districts because the courses weren't being offered in their district and it was all remote anyway. So uh, is there a way, is a way to do that? So we'd like to explore that uh, through the supervisory and contracting mechanism that's already in the law. Uh, in terms of the pipeline piece, a teacher uh, licensure and um, availability of staff due to our demographic challenges. The first one, uh, we have an approach to rest, what's called reciprocity, which allows teachers uh, or educators from other states to come to Vermont. Uh, but once here too, we have a pretty rigid process that requires an evaluation of a transcript, alignment of course syllabi with standards and so forth. It's not true reciprocity. And we know uh, there's some work going on among states to uh, make this easier to happen. Uh, but we'd like to um, basically create a process where a teacher who is licensed in another state would automatically, say if you're a high school English teacher, you'd automatically qualify for a provisional Vermont high school English teacher license, which would at least get you in the door. Um, and then you'd have a couple of years to work on making sure you met all our requirements. So a provisional license in Vermont gives uh, an individual two years to obtain a regular license. So we think the automatic granting of a provisional license, um, if, if the individual had a license in another state is the way to go. So we'd like to make that more seamless. Once again, um, we think that uh, we're gonna be relying increasingly on teachers coming from out of state for pipeline uh, needs. And so we want to attend to this issue and, and look to see what we can to uh, eliminate some of the barriers around reciprocity. This has been a perennial issue over the years. Um, and many, many principal superintendents notice, notice the challenges in this area. Uh, we'd like to eliminate an online teaching endorsement. Um, this was created, it's a separate sequence of courses uh, required for teachers. If they want to teach online, they have to have uh, a separate teaching endorsement to do that in addition to their regular teaching endorsement. Uh, we certainly believe there's a lot of uh, professional development necessary to teach online successfully, just like there is to teach successfully in any context. Um, but we don't think it's appropriate to have a separate teaching endorsement for this, particularly when there's only really one place uh, a teacher in Vermont could get that endorsement, and that's through an online academy uh, through one organization. So. Um, we think, you know, as we've learned through COVID, um, we've had the standards board waive this requirement. Um, and then the legislature extended that in August through the rest of this year. Uh, we think there's really um, no need to have this as a separate licensing requirement. Once again, it's not to say we need to have quality control and professional development to do this, but it doesn't rise to the level of needing to require a separate endorsement. Uh, this last one is, is more focused on the quality piece of this uh, bucket or heading, not necessarily the pipeline end, 
And this was based on our experience um, adjudicating uh, the revocation of a license uh, with a Burlington uh, guidance counselor um, a year or so ago. Uh, it's the first time that process was taken uh, uh, to that, the end of the process, which was an appeal to the state board, um, in my memory anyway. And um, it exposed some flaws, I think, with the process, both the Attorney General's office and the Secretary of State's office and I, we noticed that this process could be improved. Basically, when you get to that last phase of the appeal, we have to start all over and prepare uh, the State Board as a panel of lay people to go through that process and require them to have additional legal uh, support and so forth, separate from the agency's typical legal support. So what this proposal would do is transfer that last phase of the appeal uh, to the Secretary of State's office, we call the Office of Professional Regulation, which is where the appeals for um, all other professional licensing goes at the end of the day. Essentially, uh, there's a professional hearing officer who um, would still adjudicate our regulations, so they still would be educator regulations, but it would be overseen by a professional hearing officer um, who we think is in a better position to um, ensure due process and uh, eliminate some of the um, I think uh, potential potential pitfalls and liability the state could be exposed to uh, through the process as we know it. Uh, CTE, this is essentially one proposal. Um, this is a more of a technical proposal, uh, some work. We, we did a, the General Assembly authorized the pilot of um, CTE centers to look at their governance. Uh, we have several different configurations. These are career technical education centers. Um, we have several that are standalone school districts, uh, namely uh, the one in Bennington, Springfield, and in Middlebury, the Hannaford Center. Those entities are school districts unto themselves. And um, we had uh, given them some money to do a pilot study of looking at some of the financial uh, challenges relative to the current system and to what extent the current financing model for CTE centers provides a disincentive uh, for students to or to attend those centers or for schools to send those students to attend to the centers uh, because right now um, CTE tuition shows up at a local high school's budget. So it's a cost item for them. Every student that goes to a center, they have to find a way to come up with the money to pay for it. So this was analyzed. Some of you might know Bill Talbot and Deb Brighton, uh, Bill's former former CFO of the agency. Deb's been around uh, finance uh, tax issues in Vermont for quite some time. So these these groups, these districts that were involved in the pilot uh, commissioned a study from Bill and Deb, and they've done some modeling and they've come up with a couple different ideas of how to reform uh, the CTE funding system. And we think one of those models in particular is uh, more attractive and one that we'd like to bring forward for the General Assembly to consider. Uh, basically, um, this would remove that tuition piece. So there isn't necessarily a disincentive for a high school to send their student to a CTE center. Um, they would establish CTE centers with their own tax rate. Um, and uh, also we'd come up with a, uh, we look at their block grant basically to do that based on a regional assessment, um, based on po overall population and so forth, not not based on sort of the, um, the tuition moving in and out and so forth of student attendance. So this is a more technical concept. I don't know to what extent uh, the General Assembly is familiar with the work that Bill and Deb have done. It's still kind of, the ink's kind of still drying on it, um, but it's well done and something that we should introduce, we think we should introduce into the conversation at some point. Some people would say this is long overdue, um, but we have, um, some of our districts have made an investment in the modeling and we think it uh, should be considered and um, might might be useful at this time uh, when we want to ensure more access to our CTE centers. And lastly, uh, talking about modernization, um, we did a, uh, last year we did what was called an RFI, Request for Information on Statewide Student Information System. Uh, so these student information systems, each school district has their own, and they use these systems to uh, record attendance, discipline, the grades, and also as the system that reports data to the state. Um, we went, went out on what's called a Request for Information last year. Um, to understand what the vendors in the space would do if we tried to do this at the state level. Uh, we're pulling that analysis together. We'll be doing a presentation. I'll invite you all to sometime around uh, 
February vacation, school vacation. So towards the latter part of February, we'll be putting together a presentation for stakeholders to, to discuss the results of the RFI. We think the next step is to go out to bid with an RFP, request for proposals. So uh, we just like to bring the General Assembly along in that conversation. And um, because that's, this is a multi-year process, uh, but we think we can uh, improve the quality of education data in the state and also save money uh, by doing a statewide student information system. It's, it's a, an approach that's used in other states and arguably Vermont is you know, a much smaller state uh, where to a certain extent doesn't make sense for having all these separate systems at the local level and all the opportunity um, for, for the data quality uh, to be um, less than it should be. Uh, second one here, regional back office pilot. We're interested in, um, this is, I would say, uh, related to perhaps the virtual merger provisions of Act 153, the idea of um, districts, again, working together. Uh, we'd like to um, incentivize uh, some districts to agree to only one of them sort of do payroll for the other, that kind of thing. So with these, the data systems that we're talking about are, are scalable on a much larger basis than what we currently do. Uh, so we'd like to see um, sort of that regionalization, uh, which would help with um, sort of the redundancy and expertise necessary. We wouldn't, it wouldn't be predicated on the turnover and staff at the local level, bring more stability and perhaps introduce more efficiency uh, into some of this. So we'd be interested in uh, incentivizing that. And um, the last topic, um, no doubt the most glamorous topic in the entire presentation, uh, statewide school calendar. So um, this is, uh, again, um, a result of our COVID-19 experience. Um, we think this is a, a, an idea that's time has come, perhaps. Um, we think there'd be great benefit to ensuring that uh, the schools are moving in the same direction. We had more predictability on that. Uh, certainly, as you know, would allow for um, opportunities for professional development at the state level. Uh, we think about the work in front of us relative to 173 and so forth. If we had some idea or be able to predict when schools would be in session, when they would not be in session, would allow us to uh, do more of that. Um, and uh, interest in starting after Labor Day uh, is just sort of a nod to our, our economy in that regard that, um, you know, we think that would be useful. It's, you know, as you know, this year we, uh, through uh, the governor's order, delayed the start of school and got all the schools starting at the same moment. And that seemed to work out pretty well uh, for providing that predictability to the larger economy and society. So we think this is an idea whose time has come. So um, anyway, that, that concludes my presentation, a sort of general outline. I'm happy to go into these ideas in more detail. I will say just on concluding remarks that some of these uh, we are working closely with individuals to reduce down to specific language. Others like the CDD uh, AOE merger are basically policy concepts that are outlined with a rationale that we acknowledge we uh, engage, uh, need to engage with stakeholders and the legislative leaders um, to really, to do it well. Um, so there, there are different states of readiness, but we'd be happy to answer any questions or talk about these concepts in more detail. I know it's a lot. Um, oh, it, it's terrific. It's very comprehensive. Uh, it's, it was a good presentation. I uh, appreciate it. If you don't mind, there we go. We will take uh, some questions. And I'm just going to start it off with a question about literacy, if I may. Secretary French, can you, t the, the numbers are disconcerting around literacy. And I'm wondering if this is a nationwide trend. Is this something we're just seeing in Vermont? What are some of the, the factors that are causing this situation? And then what, what, are, what should we be looking to all of you to do with us partnering to, um, to improve the situation? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's certainly, uh, there's some national interest in the topic, you know, and I think, um, I had, I was fortunate last year to be selected as part of a national cohort of chiefs. We call ourselves chiefs because we go by different names in different states. And we, we had a focus group uh, down in DC on this topic and brought in some literacy experts and so forth. And I, I'll just, on a national level, make the observation that oftentimes people will say literacy is a civil right, you know, and it's, it's gotten to that moment, I think, when we consider equal opportunity in our country, particularly in a knowledge-based economy. 
that not having literacy skills and particularly critis, critical literacy school skills disenfranchises individuals from opportunity. Um, so we have that sort of broader policy trajectory. I think there's also, um, there's been the reading wars, which has certainly added energy to this, that um, this is a sort of a conflict, most, I guess, overly simply represented by the idea of phonics or, you know, um, and Chair Webb can get into this far more detail than I can, but um, with her background in education, but um, there's, there's growing acknowledgement that that war is over, if you will, that um, the science is the science and um, there's, there's a way to teach literacy. There's a lot of data on that. And, um, but the other observation is that um, our colleges of education have not embraced that. There's still a lot of philosophy um, in what, what poses for philosophy as opposed to uh, overt um, science-based literacy materials. So at any rate, I don't, I don't like to get involved in that as try to stay above that as best I can. Um, my interest in, is starting with the outcomes and saying, first, let's talk about how we might measure this. I think we do uh, as a state, which arguably once again, has some of the best outcomes in education. I mean, I think we can, we can say that uh, fairly well by looking at things like NAEP and so forth. But when we start to see the discrepancy in, in the results, you know, particularly for our socioeconomic students or students that are more at risk, we have to dig into the data a little more closely and, and take notice. Um, I think we've gotten by as a state, uh, perhaps over the last 20 years or so, and many teachers would acknowledge our students today are more complex, have more needs. As we've, we've started to observe those things, it really requires us to have a much more directed approach on issues like literacy. Um, and we, we come back to saying, let's talk firstly about how to measure the outcomes. Let's, let's sort of put that to bed and then say, um, if you can get results with this curriculum, that's fine, but let's not debate what the result should be. And particularly with Act 173, uh, which talks about sort of, I wouldn't say getting out in front of special education because that's not a really a fair characterization of the process because uh, special education is always a direct uh, right, if you will. But there's a lot of work we can do uh, to ensure students don't fall behind, you know, particularly in terms of the academic discrepancy. And a lot of the a lot of the research around literacy is a place where we start to see sort of those patterns of students falling behind. You know, by far and away, our largest disability area is learning to say disability, which often includes reading and things like of that nature, and language acquisition. So we just know we have some more work to do. And um, I think, you know, from our perspective, we just want to point districts to doing that work. Talk, let's talk about how to measure it, get them focused on it from a policy perspective, have them do a literacy plan. I think we have some expertise in the state that's pretty phenomenal. That's national level expertise like the Stern Center and so forth that we could be leveraging much better across the state. Um, so we have, we have some work to do, but I'm, I'm also thinking we have a lot of resources and uh, a lot of interest in doing the work. Thank you. Uh, Representative Webb. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, this is quite a large list. It has small little things and it has gigantic concepts to it. Um, I am wondering if you could organize some priorities that you would see for, that you would like to see that are time sensitive for this year, maybe things that we can set up for another year and, and what might be just ongoing work. No, I appreciate that. It's a, it's a, certainly we'll try to do that. I think we were trying to do more of that. It's been a fairly dynamic situation with COVID in particular. And what I mean by that is we're trying to stay in sync uh, with the federal assistance that's coming our way. Um, you know, we, we recently just received what are called, what's called ESSER II and GEAR II. Um, and we also, you know, the new presidential administration want to make sure we're moving in the same direction. Um, so absolutely, I think as those things settle in a little bit and our priorities emerge relative to those, those uh, resources, we can definitely sort of lay this out on what we would see as a priority uh, trajectory for folks. Thank you. Representative James and then Representative Conlon. Thanks. Um, thanks for being here, Secretary French. I have questions on two, two different slides. Um, Curious about, uh, just to hear a little bit more about the um, model curriculum on hate issues and um, the racial equity policy. What sort of things would the policy 
cover and how would the model curriculum kind of work with Act One and the work that's being done there on the standards? That's, that was my first question. Let me unmute, thank you. Um, yes, we have, in, just to use as an example, this is uh, one of the ideas that we fleshed out sort of as a combination of uh, bullets and specific policy language. Um, so just to give you an idea, in, in this, this slide basically contains four issues for us that we would put forward to give you some specificity on it. So in the first one, um, it's adding a new requirement that curriculum must include lessons against hate speech, hateful imagery, and discrimination. Uh, so we already have, uh, it's based on a model that's already in law around tobacco use, alcohol, drug abuse, uh, where the AOE um, works with folks to develop a model curriculum. So we would, we would extend that sort of concept to include um, uh, developing and basically charging the secretary to develop a model curriculum uh, for elementary and secondary schools to teach about these things and to include best practices and to provide professional development and technical assistance um, and encourage districts to work with their specific um, local resources. Their second strategy is to specifically expand the charge of the Act One work group. Um, so they're, they're, as we knew, they're running into this sort of boundary again between promulgation of standards versus curriculum. So we would modify uh, or expand their, their duties to include advising the secretary on the development of a model curriculum and best practices uh, to teach against hate imagery and so forth. So we would basically bring, bring them more directly involved with this work. Um, thirdly, we have the, as I mentioned, the um, policy on racial equity. Um, so we, we'd be producing or the General Assembly would direct the secretary to develop a model uh, policy in that area and uh, require school boards to develop or to adopt that policy or one equally astringent um, to address the issues. And um, so we'd be working with stakeholders to develop that model policy language. And then lastly, um, the task force on discipline reform, as I mentioned, more, I think drawing a distinction between what I've seen as a Senate bill and what we propose is to focus, go directly to the best practices, um, sort of skip the data collection piece, um, but to review uh, the in-school services and supports that are available to folks, um, particularly as an alternative to exclusionary, exclusionary discipline, um, and to recommend uh, some, some approaches that are best practice for folks and support people with adopting those. Representative James, did you have a follow-up or a, an additional question? It's a, another topic. So if folks wanted to follow up on this topic, I can certainly wait. I think it's fine. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, I was just curious to understand a little bit better about the um, proposed restructuring on CTE financing, how their tax rate would be set and whether voters would still approve their budgets or... Yeah, that's, as I mentioned, that's a fairly complex proposal, but um, the model that um, uh, Bill and Deb produced, uh, they produced a couple models, but the models we think, and I think they would agree is probably the one that's the better one, uh, basically firstly sets up CT centers as standalone uh, school districts, essentially from a budgetary standpoint. So they would have their own education spending, uh, their own equalized pupils, and therefore their own tax rate. Um, so a little different than what they go through now it basically brings them into, uh, let's say, alignment with how school districts uh, do their funding. Uh, but in addition to that, we still acknowledge there would need to be the block grant component, uh, but that block grant component would be based on, on a regional uh, analysis, not necessarily based on their, let's say, daily or monthly uh, attendance, uh, which is the sort of what informs the tuition basis that they're under right now. So the devil's in the details on that, but. Um, Basically, at this point, I just say we, we're interested in advancing that conversation and we'll bring forward uh, the results of that work. Representative Conlin. Uh, thanks very much. And, um, you know, this is, there's some great proposals here. I, I just want to ask, you know, for four years, uh, Governor Scott has talked about the um, increasing cost of our pre K 12 educational system and the declining number of students in, enrolled. Uh, and therefore higher per pupil spending. Um, and I don't see anything here that really speaks to that in any substantial way. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, I think that's a fair observation. Uh, that wasn't one of the major uh, sort of buckets. We started, I mean, once again, grounded pretty significantly in our COVID response. I think the, the best area that probably conforms to that um, is the modernization uh, sort of bucket where we're looking particularly at um, the student information system. That, that proposal is, is largely based on two elements, which is to improve the quality of data and to lower costs. Um, but we also, uh, there have, there's other items here in, in our presentation that um, do speak to costs and effectiveness. As I mentioned, the issue of like simplifying home study could be viewed as an example of simplifying regulation and therefore increasing agency capacity as opposed to adding staff to the agency. Um, the CTE funding is one uh, that I think in, imparts a certain amount of flexibility to the system to let, um, you know, sort of let student uh, interest sort of drive change in the system as opposed to uh, creating structural barriers. So I think there's elements there, but there's, your, I think it's fair assessment that there's no direct um, thing, there's no direct proposal on the table to necessarily restrain a cost per se. Representative Conlin, uh, did that answer your question? Did you have a follow up? You're good. Okay. Senator Alliance. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Secretary French. That was, um, that was great. Uh, my question is that now that we have the outline, will you be um, providing us with details on one or more of your recommendations? And I, I would assume that some of these, uh, as you have said, are higher priority for the administration than others. So will you bringing, be bringing in specific language for us or specific recommendations? And then some of the data that you have to support um, your recommendations would be extremely useful to us, I think, going forward. That's one. I've got three or four things. So why don't I enumerate those first and then I can, <laughs> we'll go from there. Um, the recommendation on uh, universal uh, pre-K, will there be a recommendation to institute universal pre-K for all schools? And then... Um, my next one is, uh, my, it's, I guess it's really a comment, but there wasn't a whole lot in there about trying to um, improve uh, mental health services uh, in the school system, whether through the school nurse office, and I understand that's Department of Health, uh, or in other ways, and I'm wondering if you've had a conversation about that. And then my last comment is, thank you for the post-Labor Day suggestion. Uh, a few years ago, I introduced an amendment on the floor of the Senate, which was passed to the other body. And I guess it died there, but I think one of the things we're all concerned about is the health and wellness of our kids. And regardless of the fact that we're moving away from agriculture in our state, I think it's really important for um, those, for people to be out in the summer months and then for kids to be able to work on that weekend when they can for, um, for Labor Day. Anyway, yeah, those so, are my uh, comments and my questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, our next step would be to produce uh, specifics for you as much as you, you know, people are interested in those topics and we have a variety of strategies. I think you know, just to use the example again of CDD, we've been working uh, with Let's Grow Kids and other stakeholders just to share with them what we're thinking. And But we acknowledge it's a complex policy space that requires a lot of uh, work together with people. So that's not something we would necessarily just bring in a specific proposal on. We've done a lot of the analysis and the data that you point to. Um, and we that's, that's certainly how we arrived at our conclusion. Uh, but it's not something we would necessarily put language on the table. There are other areas where we do have language ready to go. Um, the mental health issue is an interesting one. I just I'd react to that as we we also have a lot in flight as we, you know, the COVID work that we're about to do, we're calling uh, recovery and education. We've been working closely with the mental health uh, department to sort of conceptualize that. Um, so I think it's not necessarily something at this point we're bringing forward a policy proposal on, but it's something that's very active on our front burner in terms of the COVID response that very well could ultimately result in a policy uh, proposal. But uh, happy to share that work with you. But I think right now it's just perhaps the nature of the emergency that that 
operating under the executive order and the state of emergency has sort of put a priority on actually sort of solving that as we're moving into this next phase of the recovery. I'm not, it's not clear to me yet what the policy implications of that would be. Um, but so far, um, you know, we're working very collaboratively on an integrated basis uh, to support our schools and our communities in that area. So as you, as you follow through with that, I think it's probably important for us to stay connected. Um, and I'm talking now about the Health and Welfare Committee as well, because we've also been talking about that. But thank you for, um, for working on that. It's, it's so critical. Senator Pershing. Senator Pershing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for this list of, of items. Definitely interested in hearing the priorities and the, and the details on a lot of them. But two ones that jumped out to me was the property tax exemption for the child care facilities that are in, are in homes or, or commercial buildings. And it's probably more ways and means of finance than education, but I was wondering if that's a proportional to the portion of the building that's being used for daycare. I'm assuming that's the proposal. And then on the uh, infrastructure of the schools, and I was wondering if, if specifically you talked about a kind of a second stage of our indoor air quality program that you run, and I know you, you've supported and found some more CARES money for, which is great and specifically looking at trying to bring up all the schools to the ASHRAE indoor air quality standard. Yeah, in terms of the uh, property tax exemption, our focus is on the private centers. Um, we'd certainly be open to uh, some, some approach with the private provider or out of the home provider, so to speak. Uh, but our um, the analysis that was, as you're, you point out, done by the tax department is really focused on uh, the center-based um, businesses. Um, see what we could do there. Yeah, in terms of once again the the school um, school facilities, you know, we we sort of we're trying to uh, sort out in our own minds between school construction versus deferred maintenance, and we've had so much of the deferred maintenance uh, we've been dealing with as a result of COVID, whether it be indoor air quality, PCBs, um, you know, you name it. Uh, we think that that's an area we probably can make some progress with some of the one-time money that we're receiving. So we're working actively. We want to keep an eye on the larger school construction program, but we know that's going to be a multi-year process, a complex process involving some revision of policy, perhaps. Um, but we think deferred maintenance is something very tangible and something we can we can really make some progress on. And we've been looking at sort of I'm called the one-time money. I think you heard the, the governor refer to the you know the, a lot of the federal dollars that way. We, we kind of apply a, a strategic priority to the use of those funds so that if this we don't want uh, if we can use those funds in a strategic way to address something that would really uh, advance the quality of the system we want to try to do that and we think there's some work we could do in deferred maintenance in that way so we want to pursue that um, H, HVAC as you know is, is a more complex one and there's um, there's been some work done on that since the summer, uh, you know, around the quality and so forth. And so there's also some simple accommodations we can make um, in terms of portable filters and, and so forth. But um, yeah, absolutely, indoor air quality and heating and ventilation and safety is sort of that broad category where we see uh, deferred maintenance really being the bucket where we can make some progress. All right, thank you. If I may, uh... Mr. Secretary, before we let you go, I'm wondering, I just want to go back to the literacy. It doesn't sound as though there is a sort of a uniform uh, standard or way that we teach literacy in the state. So I'm wondering if you would just respond to that. And then I'm wondering the role in, of the common core in teaching literacy in this state. Yeah, it's definitely fair to say there's not a, a consistent approach to how we teach literacy. Um, okay. You know, I think there uh, we can, and we have some information on the different programs that people use. Um, and we know there, you know, there are some programs that are more used than others in the state. But our, um, our policy proposal, once again, is to sort of, um, I'll say, get away from the literacy war conversation and focus on outcomes. So, we, what we were proposing to do uh, last year pre-COVID was to uh, enter into a partnership with a company called Metametrics, which um, has the intellectual property behind something called Lexile scores and quantile scores. 
Um, they're sort of like a lingua franca of how to uh, connect different data. Most of our literacy benchmark assessments can report out in Lexile scores. So we've gone and uh, joined that partnership along with many states uh, in the last several months. So basically what this is gonna allow us to do is to report our SBAC scores out in this format. It allows us to get data from local school districts in this format. So it starts to set the stage for connecting, you know, cause we don't have state level data in grades pre-K through three in this area. It allows us the potential to start to connect the data from pre-K to three through the three through eight that we have with SBAC. So instead of sort of going, and we still think we need to go at the professional development around using science-based literacy, but it's to really start with the data and to say, here are the outcomes we're getting and to spend some time on, on training and supporting people to use their data and to confront the trends they're seeing in their data. Because we think honestly, that's the biggest issue. It's just people aren't perhaps looking as closely to their data as they should. Um, sure, so and I think that also the agency uh, is also looking at the data that's coming out of schools. For example, if you're following a school where you're noticing that the literacy rates have been declining, not dissimilar from, you know, if somebody's leaving a doctor's office, not getting the right medication or not, you know, being cured, you're, you're then interacting with that school and kind of, I'm just asking, you know, I'm assuming you are and saying, hey, maybe the pro, maybe the literacy steps that are being taken at this institution aren't what need to be done. Yeah, so the, the problem, it's a great theory of action. Uh, the problem is we don't have information in pre-K through three on literacy at the state level because the state the state assessments start in grade three. Yep. So um, what we're promoting is the use of this Lexile and Quantile score mm -hmm. idea. So most districts, I, I would argue, have a, what we call a benchmark assessment in grades pre-K through three that they're using already, but they're not reporting that information to the state. It's not required. So they have information at the local level um, that we want to ensure um, they're using in an appropriate manner, but we don't necessarily see the data ourselves. So you know, our, our starting point in this is to um, require them to have a policy that looks at their data, requires them to have a benchmark assessment and to look at their data to really start to identify those trends much earlier than we are now. Uh, so we have we essentially have a big gap in our data and the states doesn't have the information to, to necessarily help people in those formative stages, arguably the most important phase of literacy sure. development. But you did start your comments, correct me if I'm wrong, by saying that 50% of our students aren't reading at a certain level. So at what point are we determining that? So that's in grade three. That's the first okay. time we collect data at the state level. Okay. And that grade three uh, SBAC assessment um, for the last several years shows about 50% uh, of our students scoring on a proficient level. Okay. So at that point, essentially it's too late to your analogy in right. medicine, right. you know? So. Yeah. Uh, we want to look at the, uh, what we call benchmark assess. Benchmark assessments are, are tests that are given like three times a year, typically. Mm -hmm. um, so they're usually given in the fall, the winter, and the spring. Um, and particularly when they're given in the spring and then in the fall, it's a good indicator of, of I want to say, learning loss that might have occurred over the summertime. And also, we know in December, it helps us track to what extent students are making progress in some of those key developmental milestones yeah. in the early grades. But that's, that's something that's done very unevenly across the state. We have districts with state-of-the-art benchmark assessment capacity. We have others that are sort of in the stone age in that regard. Um, but we need to find a way, I think, to uh, help them um, improve their literacy assessment in that area, which will then drive their ability to intervene. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I, I, I know what you mean by too late. I know we don't all mean too late. I mean, we, we right. at third grade, we would go in and we would try, I think, to, we want to make certain that those students, um, you know, get the, the attention, the, you know, the teaching that they need to make certain that, you know, they, they do get caught up as, as much as possible. Uh, any final questions? Uh, we've kept uh, Secretary French 10 minutes over, which uh, this has been incredibly helpful. Uh, so we appreciate it. I'm seeing any. Okay. Well, thank you, Secretary French. Uh, great thank having you. you. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, Senate Ed and I believe Senate House. Are you, Senate House? Are you going to continue, Representative Webb, with us for a little while while we talk with uh, Ledge Council? You're muted. Uh, Sorry. Nope. Um, and the the topic 
I mean, we're all, we're uh, all we're, so happy, happy to be joining you. Sure. No, well, uh, we were just going to continue this conversation a little bit just to see if there was any reaction that Jim might have, uh, any response given everything he's heard to either things that might be popping up, uh, legislation that might need to be drafted, that kind of thing. I would enjoy staying. <laughs> we would love for you to stay. And what, what I thought we might do is all just take a stretch break and come back at 3.15. Uh, and uh, that might give uh, Jim also some time to collect his thoughts. Uh, and we can all come back uh, after a nice four minute stretch. Thank you. And my committee members, um, very happy to have, have you stay as well. Great, so let's, uh, we'll see you all in four minutes. Mr. Demaray, wonderful to have you with us. Uh, I just thought it might be a, a good moment to hear uh, from you anything that you may have heard that, uh, and we usually do this with Mike O'Grady in Natural Resource and Energy, anything you happen to hear, happen to have heard that um, there might be a conflict in statute, there might be a constitutional issue, there might be repetition, um, there, anything at all, just general thoughts or um, issues that you may have um, recognized. Sure. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, I think first, let me just go through some of the points that the governor made in his address that weren't picked up by Secretary French, um, just to highlight them, that are education uh, related points. So he mentioned uh, his proposal is for a $1.89 billion budget for pre-K through 12. Uh, he mentioned fully funding pensions, which I assume would include teachers' pensions, which would be an additional $103 million funding from last year. He mentioned expanding broadband, um, which would be a $20 million state budget proposal and working with the federal delegation for more federal support. He mentioned uh, the BSAC advancement grants, uh, uh, appropriation of two, or budget request of 2.9 million. And then, um, aside from that, he mentioned uh, expanding the lottery to um, revenue to fund childcare and talked about $20 million of additional funding for domestic colleges. Um, and then those are the points that were brought up by the governor that weren't necessarily covered by Secretary French. In terms of the points covered by Secretary French, I just thought maybe it'd be useful to go through um, where we are on some of his proposals and which ones are the most complex um, in terms of thinking about how you want to resource your time. Um, so um, the most complex ones, I think, are the restructuring of duties and responsibilities between the State Board of Education and AOE. Um, that was in S-166 last year, passed by the Senate. Uh, so there's a good place to start there. But I believe the Secretary's idea is to uh, reconsider that and, and go back and look at the whole thing again. Um, Second one that seemed very um, complex to me at least was uh, moving various functions of the CDD to AOE. So figuring out the whole pre-K, sorry, um, the whole child care um, uh, regulatory system and shifting of functions between those two agencies would be very complex. The third one that seemed complex to me was CTE financing the idea of creating uh, school districts for CTE centers and how that will work. Um, the few that you have made strides on already that you mentioned, obviously, are the after-school task force that's in place uh, from last session. Um, you have literacy reform, which there's a bill in house education uh, from last session that's been updated. Uh, that I'll be walking through this week. Um, and you've got your um, task force on school discipline. That's in Senate education, he mentioned as well. So you're moving on a few of these ideas already. Um, so aside from that, I don't have any particular conflicts or, or issues to raise, but 
they do raise different levels of complexity in terms of thinking about your time dealing with these issues. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. I know uh, one of the things Representative Webb and I have talked about, and I know the governor mentioned it, and we have Jeff Fannin and others working with AOE and other partners on is, you know, this sort of post-COVID educational opportunities for students uh, or sort of even during COVID, what that will look like. And I think that too will take up a significant amount of time. I think one of the ways I'm, I'm looking, at least my lens uh, on a lot of this is, what are the kinds of things where we really can have an impact on the lives of students? You know, I mean, there are certain things, I, without a doubt, within the infrastructure, within the governance systems that we can examine. And just so uh, colleagues know the way I'm looking at it, are these ways that we can really have a big impact? For example, the literacy, as you can tell, is a, is a big concern of mine. Um, and I think measuring it, you know, working on that is, is really important and understanding and giving teachers and our committee's done a little bit of this work, giving teachers the tools that they need to make certain that they are successful. Uh, and whether or not restructuring AOE um, right now in, in different ways, if that makes sense to get this work done. Personally, I'd rather prioritize again, things that will really will look back and say, these are the things that we did to really make a difference in the lives of children during, during this difficult time, but also areas that seem to be um, uh, lacking, such as literacy. Uh, Representative Webb, did you want to? Yes, um, I, I did want to say that um, one of the things that we're looking at uh, literacy being is a way to connect implementation of Act 173 and the use of federal dollars. So we are, we are very excited about this as being a possibility because Act 173 has been a bit stalled um, and it is the way, it is our avenue to um, support the, the, the students that have the most needs, the students that are struggling. So this is, this is an important one um, that we are excited to be starting um, this week. Great. We'll be, we'll be keeping you, up. Um, Senator Campion, you and I will we'll keep in touch on that one. And just so Senate education colleagues know, tomorrow we are taking up the, the school discipline bill, the advisory group, um, uh, and we'll certainly uh, keep you abreast of our, our work on that. Another one that I think will make a big difference uh, in the lives of children. Um, the other thing, I, I know I don't even need to say it, but just I, I kind of keep saying it to remind myself, we certainly have direction from our corner office, if you will, that, um, COVID and post-COVID is, is our priority. And uh, I know you have the same, and um, I'll be talking with the pro tem after this a little bit at four uh, to, to also understand if there are ways to sort of start to verge away from that, or if, if indeed we should continue to stay focused. Uh, Can I just, just say that we will also be looking at the school facilities um, construction. Um, we really appreciated the work that the, this committee did last year, and I was acknowledging Senator Perchlick for his work on HVAC. We did, ha we did have um, Efficiency Vermont in, and I learned that, I don't know what the percentage was, but there are a large number of, of schools that their HVAC system is only to be able to open windows. So um, these, this is is a bit of a concern and we will start looking at that. We did some work on it last year, but it, it, it just didn't make it through the process because of, of COVID. So that's another one. Yes, and you know, we've been given some direction. Uh, Senator Perchlick's work and that has, has been incredible. And I know uh, Senator Lyons uh, advocating for the mental health needs as well as environmental needs and environmental protections in our schools are something that um, I know Senator Lyons is, is working on with us in her committee and, and also a priority with Senator Dallins. Um, I'm, uh, Senator, uh, Representative Austin, please, and then Representative Brady. Uh, Representative Austin, is your hand up? Did you say Austin? Austin, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Yep. Um, I just, that's okay. I thank you for um, taking my question. Um, I just wanted to make a suggestion. We heard, we took testimony last week from Professor Nate Levinson who wrote the report on struggling students. Hmm. 
And he provided um, our committee with a pretty clear vision of what needs to happen in Vermont to address literacy um, in the state. And, you know, he mentioned like four different systems and cultures, you know, needing to kind of move together in order to really make a sustainable difference in um, moving children forward. And I just uh, thought it might be helpful for you maybe to invite him in to the Senate Ed Committee and have him provide the same uh, presentation he did for our committee because he has a very good handle on Vermont and Vermont governance and Vermont uh, educational systems um, and local control. And I just found it very helpful to at least have a sense of you know, where, we're, where we want to head if we want to make a difference. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you. Representative Brady. Thank you. This is low hanging fruit, but Jim, when it comes to school calendar things, do we have to legislate that? Or, um, yeah, okay, everybody's nodding. I think my question's being answered. Right. Well, <laughs> the <laughs> number of days is specified statute, the number of days. Uh, there's no requirement to have, um, there are requirements for school calendar coordination, but not in terms of having the same school calendar throughout the state. So I think that would require probably a piece of statute for that. Other questions? Comments uh, uh, related I, to, yes, uh, Jim, please. I just, I just want to put, put a plug for, um, uh, I presented what's going on with the whole use of public tuition for religious schools um, in house education recently. Big issue with lots of cases, moving parts, uh, thesis upon dual enrollment as well. I would just encourage you, if you are interested, to hear from uh, the constitutional expert, uh, Peter Teachout, on that question. He's got some specific recommendations as to how to deal with that. He reached out to me today. I appreciate that. And he referenced your conversation. So uh, I think we will have him into Senate Ed. Senate yeah. Ed. Thanks so much. Uh, and actually, that, you uh, presented to the Senate. We hadn't heard it, but, but we're, we are definitely interested. Uh, Representative Conlon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jim may have just distracted me uh, from, oh, I guess it was a process question. Um, OK, so for example, the. Um, uh, the secretary talked about these changes in CTE and CTE funding and how all that works. Okay, what's the next step in terms of language, let, um, a proposal to us if, if nobody has put forth a bill already speaking to this? Do they get language to Jim or? Um... Well, I heard him say, uh, Bro Conlon is, that they were going to at least flesh out their proposal in more detail um, and possibly provide language. I'm not sure about that second part. But I'm not sure how with that ranks in priority for them. So they might put that down lower, I'm not sure. Um, anything else? Okay, well, uh, how's education? Uh, Representative Webb, thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you have a vice chair this year? I do. Where is he? There he is, Representative, Representative Tupoli. That's right. I think that's in statute. <laughs> is it not that he needs to be the vice chair? I've been trying to change it for you know years, but I still have him. So. <laughs> no, <not me. laughs> uh, but seriously, it's great to have all of you here. Uh, Looking forward to continuing our work together. And uh, please, Representative Webb, if there are ever opportunities uh, to uh, collaborate, I know Ledge Council would certainly appreciate it, as I'm sure the agency and some of our other partners. <clears throat> and I think given the amount that was just put before us and the things that you're starting to work on and, and we're starting to work on, I, I very much appreciate um, you and, and me having an opportunity to talk and do some planning on how we're going to move this, these things through before crossover. Great, great. So if Senate Ed, if you don't mind just staying on for another about five minutes, uh, yeah. but we will let our uh, good colleagues and partners go. 
Yes. Thank you very much. Well, Senator You're Campion, welcome. look forward to seeing you in the hallway. I look forward to seeing you as well. See you, Representative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, Representative Harrison is still with us. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. We are down to today, uh, but I thought uh, that was a helpful, uh, albeit, uh, and very comprehensive, albeit uh, a bit overwhelming conversation. Uh, and we'll uh, look forward to digging into these things. As you know, we're hearing from, we're working on the school discipline bill tomorrow. Um, I'm hoping that we can start, and then uh, we're hearing from uh, on other bills on Thursday. I'm hoping we can start to generate some work. Um, I'm gonna talk to Senator Ballant just to make sure it's okay to move a few things while we wait for AOE and partners uh, proposals as it relates to uh, COVID work that our students might need. Okay, unless someone has questions, um, we have chairs meeting in about 30 minutes. Uh, I think we're good for the day. Okay. Senator Campion, do you yeah, want to? I'll stay on. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.